And uh, now we are going to uh, speak to Joan Shea, the uh, Minister uh, for Advanced Education and Services. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Pete. Well, quite uh, quite the response to these uh, cuts made, uh, the letter that went out late Friday. And perhaps we can start there, Minister. Uh, why the late Friday letter again this time? Well, we wanted to send it out on March 1st because we were uh, we had to give the four-month notice. To, so, we, you know, we didn't pick the first of the month, so it happened to be on a Friday. So that's why we had to send the letter out on that day. But that doesn't mean the letters couldn't have gone out earlier, does well, it? Well, and, and maybe they, they could have. I'm not sure what time they actually went out. There was certainly no plan to keep it late on Friday or whatever. But I know we had to send it out on Friday because it was the first of the month. You don't think that there's a pattern emerging that things come out late Friday for uh, the obvious, you know, uh, I guess, fact that, that you go through the weekend then and perhaps some things have calmed down by Monday? None at all, actually. And it's unfortunate that that would be part of the, the assessment of what's going on here. This is a very serious situation. And, you know, we're certainly uh, uh, concerned about how this is going to roll out and the sensitivities involved in it. And that wasn't our intent. And I really would like to just clarify that because that, that would be the furthest from the truth. Because we've been working on this issue for quite some time. And, and I can tell you, as we sat down and we looked at the dates and the possible dates and how it unfolds and, and what month we give notice and that, it certainly never, ever came into question we try to sneak this out on a on a friday afternoon you're saying that in all sincerity that this has yeah, nothing, I, I am. The late friday has nothing to do with it whatsoever absolutely not yeah no okay then so but i do want to address the issue because that, that's kind of taken away from the issue making it like a side issue but i do want to speak about the eas offices and what the decision and how uh, and how we came to make the decision that we made okay we had uh, and i, I got to back this up a bit because uh when we uh, came into government in late 2003, in our first budget in 2004, we brought in some major reforms at that time to the income support program through the Department at that time of Human Resources, Labor and Employment. And what we did then was we looked at a, a new service delivery of how we were going to deliver income support. And at the same time, we closed, we had 46 offices in the province and we closed 20 and had 26 sites remaining. From those 26 sites, we delivered income support in a different way, in, in a more computerized way, I guess, than what we had previously. And at the same time, in 2004, we decided that we would start opening uh, career work centers across the province, and we'd put a focus on helping people attached to the labor market. Mm -hmm. So we opened the first career work center in 2005. And basically, our career work centers are places where people can go for employment counseling, assistance with resume writing, uh, referral to employment programs, to inquire about training, funding. Uh, we also provide information in our centers about the student aid program. So it's a place for people who are out of work and who need assistance to attach to the labor market. And this would be the center where they would go. Then in 2009, the, the devolution of the Labor Market Development Agreement came from the federal government to the provincial government. So at that time, we uh, took on the agreement where the federal government gives us a lump sum of money every year to offer programs to people who are EI eligible. And that's an important distinction because the funding that comes through that agreement is only spent on people who are considered EI eligible. So with that agreement, we also inherited the EAS offices. These are the ones now that we announced that we're going to close. Mm -hmm. So what we've had been going now since 2009, and when we, when we, through the process of devolution, we agreed that we would keep the offices open until March of 2012, but we actually extended them for a year. What that, those offices do, they provide very similar services to what we provide in our career work centers, but they only provide them to EI-eligible clients. And therefore, we had two systems in place. We had our career work centers, where if you're a recent graduate from a post-secondary institution or somebody trying to get off income support or somebody who hasn't been in the workforce trying to get in the workforce, you went to that center. If you're EI-eligible, AS office. They then had to come back to our career work center and meet with another worker in order to finalize their applications and get the funding that they that they um, were approved for. Mm -hmm. So they ended up having to go to two places instead of one. So we felt that we were then having duplicate offices, oftentimes in the same communities where people would have to go to one office or the other. We felt that we only needed one place where people could go and get these employment services. 
The, EA, the EAS offices, from that devolution from the agreement, cost us $14 million a year. That $14 million a year is not a budget cut. That money is still in that agreement and that we want to reprofile that money to ensure that more people have um, access to skills development, meaning to be able to go back to post-secondary education or wage subsidies for apprentices or other programs to, make, to help people attach to the labor market. So it's not a budget cut. Uh, these offices, though, did offer some uh, assistance by way of, uh, I guess, some expertise, some advice, some, uh, and it brought it straight to uh, the, you know, the very uh, local area. That's going to change. And do you think there's going to be hardship on these people who now have to travel to get the same, uh, I guess, one-on-one -on -one kind of experience? Um, and can your offices uh, handle the? Uh, the, the, the work that's going to be coming now to people who are, you're not increasing the number of people under the, par the department. Um, you're going to have to handle it with who you have in place. Is it possible? Well, let me address that from two fronts. One is that the people who get services through the EAS office also had to have a worker at our centers as well. So there was, a, there was two workers assigned to each person. So we, we already carry these cases. The second thing is that although these offices were out in more rural and remote areas, they only served people who were EI eligible. Mm -hmm. So if you had two people from a community, both needed employment services, one was EI eligible, they could go to the office. If the other person wasn't, they had to seek out the, the services that we have available in our career work centers anyway. So, you know, it, it's only the people who were EI eligible who could use these offices because it was paid for under the EI program. Uh, so the, the centers that we have set up, and there will be 26 sites where we do, where we have our career work centers or other off offices offering employment services, anyone other than those EI eligible would have to use these offices anyway. So it was a two-tier system set up. I guess you're going to have another 220 some odd people now to deal with. That's the most unfortunate part of this decision, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that we, we did have duplicate services. We do have the capacity to do the work in the offices. The clients didn't like having to go to two offices. Oftentimes these offices were less than a kilometer from each other work center. We inherited these. These were not uh, offices that we created. And, uh, we, you know, under the devolution, we did have the agreement that we would keep them open until at least March 2012. We did extend them for a year to make sure that we had the appropriate analysis done to ensure that we could handle the workload if we, uh, if we closed these offices. And uh, as I said before, uh, everyone other than those EI eligible would receive services to our career work centers anyway. Are you uh, concerned about the impact that this will have on these third-party providers, uh, you know, uh, losing these contracts, uh, what it may mean for their organizations? Absolutely, and, that, that, and therefore it lies the, the difficulty in making a decision like this because it was simply just on whether or not we could do the work and did we need the duplication. It would be a very easy decision to make. But we wanted to uh, do our homework to ensure we could have that capacity, and we had to be sensitive in doing that because we realized that these groups depend on this funding and although they offer EAS offices, sometimes it's probably in some of uh, some groups the only source of funding they have and it enables them to do more than just that and, and maintain their offices and that. So, yes, we are concerned and certainly concerned about the people who will lose their jobs because of this as well because that's, that's a consequence sometimes of making these difficult decisions and that's what makes the decision so difficult, Pete, in the first place. Mr. Shea, I'm just reading from an article here in the National Post. I guess it was today, and it's talking about... Uh, the budget uh, coming down from the federal government um, soon, and it's talking about they are preparing to cut $2 billion uh, that they're sending to the provinces now uh, to train those who qualify for employment insurance. It says it transfers a further $500 million under labor market agreements to train those not eligible for EI. So all told, between the money for EI eligible and non-EI eligible, it's a 2.5. Uh, billion that they're preparing to cut from the transfers to the provinces. Is that going to affect all of this? I don't know how what will happen in the province or how that will fall out, 
but any time there's changes to the labour market agreement uh, and the uh, the funding is adjusted that flows to the province, services have to be adjusted as well, whether it's the delivery of services or the amount of service that we can provide. Other than, and, I've, and I've also read the article that you just spoke about there, and other than that article, I don't have any further detail. But I can say that if funding is affected, either increased or decreased, that we have to adjust how we make decisions as well. And as long as it's the devolution and the money is flowing into the province to make the decisions, uh, we, you know, we'll make those decisions based on the amount that comes in. Uh, and uh, when I read that article this morning, you know, certainly uh, want to see what the detail is. How much money will be flowing? Will it be true devolution that we make the decisions, or will it? I wouldn't have those answers. And finally, uh, before I let you go, uh, any other uh, further job cuts in your department anticipated? Well, you know, as we go through the budget process and we look at how we offer services and uh, and how we, um, we we come together as a new department and create our new organizational chart, we'll make those decisions at that time. Uh, but, you know, we, we're, we're certainly cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, this is a sensitive time for people, but we also have to make sure that as a department we live well within our means as well. All right. I uh, appreciate your time today, and uh, I'll, all I'll say in closing is that uh, everybody's going to be watching, of course, next time to see when the next announcement comes out. You know that, right? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> all right. No, okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye now. Mr. Jones Shea there.